Hey guys, this is Adwikta. This is Murps, and welcome to part one of uh, what we hope is a very short four hours, but probably very lengthy six hours of video, uh, basically introducing Angoro and us telling you exactly what to expect and us revealing our tier list scores for you to completely say that we are wrong. So welcome, welcome. This looking forward is to the, the next six Angoro hours. tier list review. And this mm -hmm. is for Arena and Arena only, in case you have no idea what the Grinning Goat does. We do Arena only. Um, so, to whatever extent these may be amazing cards for Constructed, they probably suck for Arena, and the really good cards for Arena may just be Yetis, which is not terribly impressive for Constructed. Um, we're going to start by setting the stage of Ungoro, and the stage for Ungoro is not like just dinosaurs came in from nothing, right? Like, there's no spontaneous generation of dinosaurs, we're talking a lot about adaptation. So the Arena is going to adapt and evolve from its current state, into the Ungoro state by losing some uh, vestigial cards that we don't need in, wow. uh, in the Year of the Mammoth. I'm like a scientist. Um, Damn. And, and gaining some new dinosaur cards. But at its core, most of the things will still stay there because we're still in the arena. And the basis in which we are building upon is 7.1. Right, that is where we're coming from, and we have confirmed with Blizzard that none of the offering odds rules are going to be changed from the outset. So what that means is it's still very much going to look and feel like 7.1 in the big picture, and we're just going to layer things on top of it, okay? So let's start by talking first about um, 7.1. And you know, I'll, I'll actually give the agenda like for the whole entire thing, because this thing's going to be six hours, you may want to skip around. There's a whole bunch of videos, um, and you can just click the one corresponding to the class that you care about, if that's what you care about. We're going to do neutrals. Um, okay, so we're going to start off by talking about 7.1, then we're going to move on to things like offering odds, and just like mechanical things that are objective about how Angoro Arena is going to work. And then we're going to move on to my meta predictions um, about how the meta is going to shape up. And follow, following that, we'll finally get to the card scores, where we will reveal every single card uh, in Angoro and what their scores are. And uh, uh, starting with neutrals, followed by classes going down the list. And you can just click on the video if you want to skip any of this. Um, but if you're hardcore into the arena like we are, you want to listen to all six hours, and, uh, and, and you will not even be bored at all by six hours of us talking about this. Um, Murps is looking skeptical, uh, but hopefully you'll last longer than Murps. All right, let's do this. First things first, 7.1, Murps. What is 7.1 about? Give, uh, give me three bullet points about 7.1 and the arena meta. Oh, wow. All right, it's a good thing you asked this right now rather than at the end. So uh, 7.1 was about um, basically, let me get this right. Um, okay, not threat and response. That's, oh, yes, that's threat and response. Yes, threat and response, not answer and response. Answer oh, and response right. is the one no, we I keep got saying. It right. You got it right. Oh, gosh. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, part of it is threat and response, right? Um, another part. Uh, ooh, what is threat and, and response? Right, right. I got so excited. I got it right. Oh my gosh! Threat and re response is basically because of the way that um, the because of the way the changes played out. What happened in a typical seven point one game is uh, you basically play a threat and uh, you also just respond to your opponents like their threats, right? And it turns into less of a I drop something on one, drop something on two, drop something on three, and it's mo mostly so you present problems and then see if they have uh, an answer. Right? So your problem is like, I have an 8-8 on the board, and their answer is like, assassinate. And you're like, damn, all right, let's try to make a new problem. Um, that's not to say Curve Stone is dead. You no. can still curve. Some classes still do it very well, like Hunter. Um, but it's all about class cards. If you want to curve on 1 and 2, you need to have the class cards to back it up because the neutral offering rates have been changed and with GVG leaving in, in this way in which you're just not going to be able to get a curve on two even uh, from neutral cards. You're, not, you're going to get about half of the curve that you want to build an aggro deck, if that. Yep. So without twos, it's become an answer and response meta. You, you mean threat and response. Sorry, yes, threat and response. Oh, we almost had it. Okay. <laughs> it's a threat and response meta. So between the change of not allowing every class to curve out uh, and so 
when we say Arena 7.1, we mean the set of offering odds changes that Blizzard released um, in the middle of MSG. And the changes are that spells are more uh, than class cards now by a factor of 1.7. So it's 1 to 1.7. That's how many more spells there are. Uh, and also neutral... Co uh, sorry, I'm going to get this right. Neutral classic and basic cards. So your Yetis, your Bloodborne right. Raptors, your MCTs, your big game hunters, all, all, all of those are sea giants. They are reduced by half compared to like a card from a, a set, even if it's not a class card. So those are the big changes that came in. There's also like these this like one off like having the offering rate for Flame Strike and for Abyssal Enforcer, but we can just set that off to the side. Uh, that's like the collection of changes that Blizzard brought on, along with the rebalancing of offering rates of rarities. So that now commons and rares, and this is if you haven't been around for the last month, because uh, that's what seven point one was. Um, the uh, commons and the rares are now offered at the same exact rates. So any particular rare card is offered the same rate of any particular common cards, as long as they're the same type. So the uh, the rare spells are offered the same as the common spells, etc. And uh, epics were offered in 7.1. They were offered 0.7 as much as um, as your rares and commons, but because of the way these things work, I'm not going to go into it too much. In Ungoro, it will be 0.5. So your epic offering rate is actually going down. Which was a good thing, because you had a little too many epics and they all kind of sucked um, in 7.1. Uh, and also, legendary rates have been bumped up. They're around 0.1 um, for for your regular uh, uh, cards, compared to the... Um, well, they're more than 0.1. They're like 0.25, actually, compared to your regular offering rate. Like, if you set 1 as a class minion, then legendaries are uh are 0.25 like class legendaries so uh, i think what helps people out is um before this you got a, almost one legendary per draft right in 7.1 yes in 7.1 you got one legendary per draft so now what is it oh no now it's now it's basically the same it's only like a little bit more sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just want to get that out there because you throw around a lot of numbers but at the end of the day like i think that helps people out the most mm -hmm. okay um, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about uh, the offering odds more next, but I just want to like let you guys know in case you were gone for a month uh, what seven point one meta is, and so that's why, especially the spell increase and the lack of two drops, um, that created this threat and response meta that we're talking about. Okay, what else about seven point one? There was other stuff about seven point one. Okay, it's just a threat and response meta. We're done. Okay, so here's one more uh, aspect of a threat and response meta that 7.1 developed, which is that because there's no more two drops, you can go fast. So if you have one drops and two drops, usually Hunter again, but any class can do it. And there's a lot of classes with actually like sneaky one drops and two drops, right? Like Paladins have a bunch of ones, but no twos to back it up. Mages actually have a good balance of ones and twos. And so you can create a much more effective aggro deck than you used to be able to, not because your aggro deck is actually very good, but because your opponents, half the time, don't play a two. And so they're now two turns behind rather than one turn behind, right? Like, before, if your opponent had twos and you went first, you could play a one drop, but they'll coin out a two and then play another two, and then you were stopped. Now, if you actually build an aggro deck, first of all, you have much fewer cards than you used to compared to your opponents because they all have value decks now. But you also are able to really get a good start on your uh, aggression. So the threat and response meta does make way for this like aggro option to be even more one-sided, right? So you really have to center your draft on it, and then it works pretty well, um, especially because a lot of decks are slower. We always say uh, the deck that wins is usually the one that's a tiny bit slower than the other deck, or the one that is way faster than the other deck. So now you're allowed to go way faster than even an average deck, which makes aggro actually more viable, I think. Uh, but it's harder to build. And I'll add a third point in here, which is RNG. Like, draft-based RNG is so huge. Because in a threat and response meta, you need to pick threats and you need to pick responses. That is not a hard thing to do, because true threats are really, really good cards. And responses, meaning like removals generally, are all really, really good cards. So it doesn't take a lot of drafting skill to say like, oh, I see a good card, I'm going to take it. And that determines such a huge part of uh, whether you win or lose a game now that um, the RNG factor has really gone up, 
right? Like, almost all the arena veterans have come out against uh, the 7.1 meta as being a much more random, much lower reward for skill kind of meta than what arena was used to. Um, it's not to say it's here to stay necessarily, but we're still in it for now. So that's the base. We've set up 7.1. Now let's talk about Ungoro. We're going to start talking about Ungoro by giving you uh, an overview of ooh, spreadsheet um, of what the ooh. actual offering odds are. The actual offering odds in Ungoro, and these are all Ungoro cards. So if you're trying to think about in the Ungoro meta what a fireball is, you just divide it by two, like whatever set it is, because it doesn't have the set bonus. And the set bonus is 100%. Plus 100%. It's double. It's nice and simple. And then if you want to uh, find out what a, a classic neutral uh, uh, card would be, so like a Yeti or a Raptor, you divide it by four from what the, this number is. So you're going to see like no, like let's do a Yeti. Yeti is a common or rare neutral minion, right? So it's 0.4 and then you divide it by four, so it's 0.1. So you're going to see 0.1 Yetis per deck. I don't know why we get these numbers. Let's just make these easy. Uh, by the way, this is how the tier list is done. So much rounding. So if you ever wonder why something's wrong, it's probably because I did one of these rounding errors. Yeah, so these are not like, once they're rounded, they're not like exact, but it does help you see more or less of... exact. What are, like yeah, what else yeah. are you going to use it for? Um, okay, so here are the uh, um, the offered per draft numbers. It is one point four for a class spell uh, in Ungoro, which is zero point seven for a normal class spell like a fireball, zero point eight for a class minion. So um, that is like an Angoro minion and a minion from a prior expansion uh, that is a, a class minion, like a Flame Wreath Faceless, for example, 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven would be 0 0.4. Um, and then Epic, as you can see, are exactly half of their common or rare counterparts. So this is the number of times you will be offered per draft of each individual particular card. So whenever you see a card, you can just map it onto here and you can say, oh, look, uh, I see this awesome, amazing spell. How many of these am I going to get? It's an Angoro card. Okay, it was, you're going to get 1.4 per draft on average. Which again right. means that by the time you get to like 4.0 or something, you're probably going to see two, two and a half of these per deck <laughs> if it's that good of a spell. Gastropods uh, everywhere. Gastropods, man. So a Gastropod is, uh, or just spoiler alert, it's the best common neutral minion uh, in the expansion. So it is a common or rare neutral minion and it is 0 0.4. Um, so you're going to see half of a gastropod uh, per per draft. Which, you know, it's not that high. It's all right. Uh, it does, like basically you're gonna see a lot more than uh, some other cards as well, just because we have the Angoro bonus, but yeah. Right, uh, but this is with the Angoro bonus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it's also why you see, like, Bloodfin Raptors never. Uh... Yes. Um, I think more importantly with the, with, the, with neutral cards is you think you see them a lot because literally every opponent has them rather than a class where you actually have to face that particular class. Okay. So these are the offering odds for whatever, you know, you may take them as. And after that, I want to I wanna really talk about um, the, uh, the, the big picture of what Angoro is going to be about which is curve and size, right? Like every time we evaluate a new meta, we look at how big, uh, how slow, how fast, how big, how small the cards being added are and how that's going to shift the meta. Like when TGT came out, the Kraken, which is leaving now, by the way, shifted the meta pretty late, right? Kraken and snowball cards made the games a bit longer, a bit more snowball-y. And so you had the nine mana card that had, was so impactful that people needed to draft it and use it. Other uh, um, things, such as uh, GVG, really sped up the meta. And that has to do with the size of minis. So we're going to care about the size. And we're also going to care about the curve. Because weird quirks happen with the curve, depending on... Like, MSG was notorious for the 4-3 meta, where there were just four threes everywhere for 3 mana. Because the curve now started on 3 rather than 2, and everybody had 3 drops, and half of them were 4 threes. That you just saw 4 threes everywhere. So that's no longer the case now. In the Ungoro meta, 
there is nothing, like absolutely nothing special about the curve. There's not more two threes than three twos. There's not, I mean, there's more four threes than three fours because there are no four three fours, but there's not a lot of four threes either. In fact, three drops are all weird now, kind of like how they were in classic. They're either three threes, which is not that great, and we'll, we'll get into this, uh, or, or they're weird. In fact, Angoro is going to be really big for one of the first themes that we're going to talk about, which is weak curves. Most of the cars that Ungoro has added on your curve uh, it are, are not like the best curve cards. Three drops are kind of an exception, but they didn't add enough two drops to make it strong. The four drops aren't even four drops for the most part. They're like, you know, deal two damage and put a 3-3 three, three body on there. They're like situationally playable. Um, so the curves are getting weaker. And one of the other ways the curves get weaker, not just with cards, is by not having enough cards. So I'm going to tell you the net amount of options that you lose for each of these curves. With Angoro coming in and with the Mammoth sets going out. And I can't show you the numbers here. But you gain about half of a one drop. And, and this is approximately, um, this is approximately the, the offering uh, rates. Maybe like half of this number is the offering rate. Somewhere between half and one is how many you'll be offered over the course of a draft. One and a half two drops you gain. So we're actually getting more two drops than before on Goro, but just by a little, like one and a half, you'll take it, right? But it's, uh, especially with how low the two drop offering rates were, but it's not game breaking. Like this is not going to cause huge shifts in the meta. You get 1.5 less three drops. Again, not a huge deal. The sets leaving all had a whole ton of three drops. So you were going, we were going to lose some anyway. In fact, if you listen to the Life Forge t three weeks ago, we were saying, hey, if Angoro doesn't come out with some good, strong three drops, we may have a problem with three drops going out of the meta just like two drops did. But that wasn't the case. Angoro is actually going to come out with a lot of good three drops. So it kind of held the fort here. So three drop is still when the curve starts, when the guaranteed curve starts, when you can really expect that your opponent will play a card on that turn. Um, but four drops, you're losing eight. That's eight less options per draft of four drops. And four drops are anything that's like a 4-4 or a 3-5 or a 4-5 or a 5-4 or like even like a 2-7. Just anything like that. That's not like a 3-3 three, three on 4, right? Or like a 4-3 four, on 4. Those don't count. That is a lot. That is a catastrophic loss of four drops from where we had before. And we weren't really swimming in four drops before either. Um, we were okay. We were doing well with four drops. We were never really hurting for four drops. But now, with eight fewer options per draft, you're really going to kind of be hurting for two drops. Uh, for four drops. You're, you're going to be hurting for them a little bit. You're going to have to actually worry about it. Because you almost never worried about four drops before. But you're going to have to now. Um, and that's a really new thing that's going to come in in Angoro. Um, you're going to lose two and a half five drops offered. Again, not a big deal. In fact, if anything, I like it. Because you were always offered too many five drops in uh in 7.1 and you ended up with like five five drops and you're like i don't really want five five drops uh so this is not a problematic change uh you lose half of a six drop and you gain two uh two offer cards that are above uh that seven mana or above and that's going to be another theme of angoro so two may not seem like it's very big but because like you know you also like gain one and a half two drops i didn't make a big deal out of that but that's because you need like five to six two drops. How many like seven plus mana cards do you need? Like one, two? You don't need any of them, right? Like you're on a different scale. So even increasing it by two makes a huge difference. And that comes to the other big theme of Angoro, which is that you're going to get a lot more big dues than you used to. You're going to be offered two more of them, and you're probably going to want to pick at least one. So whatever 7.1 made an impression in your head about like how big your like curve is skewing, move it one more card in the 7 plus slot. And then you have about how many big stuff that you want. So if you do what I do, which is whenever you're drafting, you're counting big stuff, like plus one to that. That's a pretty safe bet. Um, so again, this isn't like the biggest curve changes, right? Like, we'll sometimes make huge deals about curve changes because it really changes the way the game is played. And it's like the secret arena knowledge that if you get it, you do well. If you don't get it, you'll struggle a bit and you're not performing optimally. But that's not really a huge concern here for Angoro. 
four drops has a catastrophic loss. Remember that. But otherwise, just think of the curve being generally a bit hollowed out in the middle around like three, four, five, and six, and then getting a bit more on the tail end with the big cards. So that's what your general drafting is going to be like for the average class. Classes are going to be different, obviously. This is not counting class cards. This is just looking at neutrals. Um, and we'll talk about classes uh, later um, when we do each classes. But this is the general Ungoral meta. All right. So I thought you had four points, man. I do have four points. I was wondering if you wanted to chime in and have some thoughts about uh, the curve and the big dudes. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I don't think about curves and big dudes quite often, especially not combined. But uh, I will say that um, this is something that we have seen. It's it's not anything new. It's a continuation, right, in mm -hmm. terms of weak curves. 7.1, if we're talking about weak curves in Angoro, 7.1 weakened it. And this is just sort of following that trend, right? Mm -hmm. And we might see... Uh, just very interesting gameplay where necessarily, you know, games could start off on turn two and, you know, they can continue on turn three and turn four. But like you said, we have these weird cards, right? Pre 7.1, it was very easy to see like a two, three or three, two followed by a three, four. Like we used to have three, fours. We, we never have three, fours anymore. No. Uh, followed, followed by like either a four, five or a five, four. Now, you know, you're going to see like uh, more stuff with battle cry, stuff with death rattle, stuff that puts more cards into your hands, just mm. weird stuff. So contributing to the weak curve and big dudes. Look, the expansion is about dinosaurs, man. They had to add big dudes. I will say most of the big dudes are not dinosaurs. They're, they're, uh, they're still like a lot. They're still a lot. Stuff, but yeah, but they're big. Um, yeah, yeah, they're big. One point I do want to make is that Curvestone's not dead. It wasn't dead in 7.1. It was actually, it got, Curvestone got hurt a lot more by MSG coming out than it ever did by 7.1 coming out. The biggest contribution 7.1 made was pushing the curve back from 2 to 3. Because 2 curve was hanging on by a thread when the MSG cards came out and there weren't enough 2s. And 7.1 kicked out GVG. And so it totally took the legs under the, uh, out of the 2 drop neutral slot. And then it also reduced the offering bonus to classic cards, which have a lot of two drops. And so we're we're just in this zone now where it is very inconsistent to try to draft anything more than like three or four two drops. And uh, that's that's what it did. On the other hand, your curve still starts on three. If you take the four threes, if you take like your Scarlet Crusaders, if you take your Harvest Golems, you're going to still be able to curve out three into four into five. And against a normal deck that's not trying to go super aggressive, remember now, there's a switch in deck building where you say, I'm going super aggressive, or I'm not. There's not a lot of middle ground there anymore. So you either do one and two drops, and that takes up a lot of slots in your deck. And so you have to go aggressive because you don't have the card advantage to back it up. Or you go more normal, which is start on three. And what happens when you start on three? You're playing Curve Stone. You're playing Curve Stone starting on three. Uh, sometimes with the helper of like a 2-2 two, two on 2, right? Or like a 1-2 or a 2-1 on 2. Um, or like a dagger if you're the rogue. But generally you're playing curve stone still. It's, uh, if anything, it's more advanced curve stone than, uh, than what we had before. So curve stone's not dead. It's just pushed later on. And what that also means is that even if you get ahead on curve stone, you have one less turn to be able to deal damage to your opponent's face or to get an extra advantage before like board clears happen before large removals happen you know all the bad stuff that having more mana allows your opponent to do so curve stone is not dead it's weakened and it's delayed but everyone's still playing curve stone because this is still arena like when you compare an arena game to a constructed game it's still curve stone um it's just much more answer and uh sorry threat and response than it used to be okay um so in case you were wondering i just thought i'd throw some of this stuff out here uh the catastrophic loss in four drops um, you may think, like, what's actually leaving the meta, right? Like, what do we no longer have? Um, Evil Heckler is something we no longer have. Um, but the main loss in 4-drop actually comes from MSG no longer having an offering bonus. Because MSG had a crap ton of 4-drops. And now all of them are losing offering bonuses. So it's the equivalent of removing an entire set with all those good four drops. Like Chemist, Reporter, Hose and Healer. Like all of them have their offering rates halved effectively. So that's where the catastrophic loss of four drops actually happened. Um, and there's no replacements. 
Like, we'll go over the neutral cards. You're not going to see, like, there's one good four drop. That's it. Um, and if you're wondering what, what, the hell, what happened with the big dudes, there's just a lot more big dudes being added. They actually took away a bunch of big dudes, all right? Not just Kraken, but, like, Devil's War is gone. Your Mongar is gone. Cavaldia Raider's gone. Um, like, those are, those are pretty big dudes. Um, okay. So let's, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next theme. I always do four themes for these because I think four is a really good number that can capture uh, a, a meta and all of its uh, elements in the big picture, right? Like, and anything more specific than that, you're going to drill down to like playing around individual cards or like playing against an individual class. Um, so one of the things that's going to be a prevalent feature, and we'll, you'll realize this once we, uh, talk, once we go down the card reviews, are, uh, are taunts and freezes. A lot of taunts coming in, a lot of freezes coming in. And by a lot of freezes, I don't actually mean there's a lot of freezes. I just mean there's a couple, and that's a lot because we usually get none. Right. And these cards are going to be impactful, right? Mm -hmm. um, you are going to see uh, the freeze effect quite often just because uh, uh, the couple of cards that do freeze, uh, you are going to draft. Yep. They're very good cards because well, uh, cards disproportionately affect the meta. The good cards affect the meta the most. And when we look down the good best cards, you're going to see a pattern. It's going to be taunt, freeze, taunt, freeze, taunt, freeze. Um, what was the, another expansion that had a whole bunch of taunts? Oh my gosh. The uh, old god. Like, I love how old gods introduced gods, but for us, the re employers, it was basically just taunts. taunts. Psychotron lots and, lots and taunts. Fog Creeper. Yep. And that lots of taunts, you know what happened to old gods? It's still here. It didn't get rotated out. And if anything, I mean, literally, like, it's offering odds got increased because we removed some of the other cards. Right. So we're in, we're going to be in the biggest taunt meta that the arena has ever seen. So if you remember how stale Old Gods was when it comes to on-the-board play and all the taunts and not being able to be aggressive unless you're Hunter because your hero power goes through taunts, that's what's going to happen again. Like, aggro is getting stopped pretty cold unless you're hunter and that's only because you can go through taunts as hunter and you can't with other classes um there's just a lot of taunt cards and that's what happens when you add taunt cards now to the meta's credit you also have more removals than you did in old gods because one of the problems with old gods was there wasn't a lot of removals going on and now you actually do have a lot of removals because blizzard did increase uh, spells uh by 1.7 um which which does help most classes and uh, it doesn't help a class like Warrior, but Warrior's got a weapon, which has an offering bonus. And they got a lot of their, like, and all none of the cards that were removed were weapons. So they're going to get a big weapon bonus compared to 7.1, which is needed because 7.1 Warrior was a real joke. Um, okay, so Taunt and Freeze. What that's going to do is, so whereas the weak curve and the big dudes kind of set the overall landscape of the meta when it comes to how fast, how slow you want to do in the meta, Taunt and Freeze really tells you what you can't do, and that is go fast. If you're going to try to go fast, you need enough removals to actually kill uh, all the taunts that come in, or silences, and you need reach. Because later on, they're going to taunt, and you're going to run out of steam, and you're going to need to get through the taunt. Uh, a lot of the taunts coming in aren't even big, so you don't need, like, the biggest removals necessarily, but you do need removals. And one last theme, and this theme will, well, this will guide us into the actual card reviews, because the first few cards, the top few cards, the best few neutral cards, all fit this theme. And that is small drop, big value which is what Merce was talking about uh, a little earlier with the weak curves, which is the curve is kind of weak in part, not because Blizzard isn't printing cards, at least in the two and three drop slot. They are printing two mana, three mana, and one mana cards just as much as they used to. But a lot of these cards are not heavy tempo curve cards. They are in fact like card draw cards that are actually better for control decks and better for decks that um, that play them in the late game and uh, or there's something with an ability that works better if there are larger minions on the board right either freezes right you'd rather freeze a large minion than a small one or like poisonous which destroys any minion it touches so is that a good curve card yes but it's a better card off curve because you wanted to hit the six six not the three three even though it could take care of a 3-3, and that's pretty good for a 2-drop. 
Right. It's actually kind of interesting. Blizzard uh, has always thought about, like, it's like, okay, how can we keep on printing good sort of early drops, right, that you actually want to put into your deck, but at the same time, don't sort of... Uh, the problem with with um, sort of the Curve Stone Meadow is you front load all of the stats, right? Mm -hmm. Like something even as simple as a Raptor, right? And we don't even think of that as a great two drop, but something like a Raptor, you go sort of all in on its value just by playing the card, which, I mean, that's how it should be with a card. Um, but you run into this problem uh, from Blizzard's side, right? You're just like, well, like, if they do that, if they're getting all their value at the start, then we might devolve back into Curve Stone. So what do we do? We just print a card that you can use in the early game, but you don't extract all of its value when you play it, right? Or you, um, like, its value comes from something else and not just you vomiting the stats out onto the board. It's a pretty interesting solution, I think. But I love it. I love the solution. Yeah. I think this is going to make, first of all, it opens up the draft, right? That's the yes, best thing about definitely. it. Definitely. Because you can draft these cards and you're not committed. The problem no. with 7.1 is when you draft any small cards, you're committing yourself to a more aggressive playstyle or else you're losing your card advantage later on to any normal deck. You no longer have to do that, and it's kind of beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so it really evens out a lot of like the decks and lets you play to the different archetypes and lets you really build the deck that you want to build. And it it doesn't reward going all in on combos or going all in on aggression or going all in on uh, control even. Yeah, they've definitely learned sort of their own lesson, right? In GBG, they thought if we make a small card. It has to get a lot of value because it takes up a card, right? A card in itself is very valuable. And so let's front load all of this. And at the end of the day, it's still very, very small. So it's fine. And they realized their mistake when... It's when just... GVG was released and they saw right. what happened. <laughs> uh, and they realized, oh, if they just play tons of small drops and each one gets like double its value... Whereas if a four drop only gets like 1.2 times its value, you know, something like that, uh, that's not good. Then uh, we're just printing like supremely overpowered cards. And I agree with you. I think this is a very elegant solution to make a small drop have overall mm -hmm. uh, lots of value, but prevent you from going all in. And this is, this is so big. This is like a commitment here. This yeah. is all the neutral, um, like, you know, more than half the neutral cards that are small fit this category. Like, it's a huge departure from the kinds of cards that Blizzard typically prints in mass. Um, and it's, this is going to shake the meta more than anything else we said. Like, big dudes, like, fine, you're going to get one extra big dude, not a huge deal. Weak curves, uh, you just got to watch out for it, right? You got to rank your, your mid minions a bit higher if you uh, actually care about, you know, curving out. Um, taunts and freezes just stack up on removals pay a little attention right save them if you need to remove the taunt don't just burn your removals for tempo but the small drop big value point that shapes your draft that shapes your gameplay that shapes whether you push face or hold on to your cards like that shapes everything like your whole way of thinking should be changing if you're thinking about things in a high like um like resources kind of kind of way of judging of like predicting what your opponent's going to do and seeing how many cards he has in his hand and like thinking well i haven't seen this many two drops so he must have x amount of two drops left in his like it changes everything um okay so that's our overview of the meta and as you see we're we're, we're very broad we're, we're going to start broad and the whole point of this video review series is to start zooming in right we start huge broad we start with 7.1 where it already exists we're now talking about what you're going to be offered and the big picture of how Unguerl is going to look and then we're going to get into specific cars next in the neutral class that everyone's going to have but doesn't really define any particular class just the meta like to get really in detail about what we mean by each of these themes and then we're going to focus on each class and how to play each class how to play against each class and how to use each class card so we're drilling down and stick with us hit the next video we're gonna go with every we're gonna reveal every single neutral card and their tier list scores